Good evening. Welcome to this launch event uh, for new collections by three authors published by Blood Axe. Um, we have, in fact, a second, fourth and a sixth collection by the three poets. We're starting off with Jane Griffiths, reading from her new collection, Little Silver, which is her sixth collection. And she will be followed by Shazia Qureshi, reading from her second collection, The Glimmer. And then we will have Greta Stoddart reading from her fourth collection, Full. Um, Jane is going to read first, followed by Shazia, followed by Greta, and then we'll do the same thing again. And at the end of the event, the poets will come together for a discussion. Um, we've been publishing Jane Griffith since the year 2000, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with her over that time. Um, as well as the individual collections, uh, she's published a new and selected poems of, of, of her first few books called Another Country, um, which was shortlisted for the Ford Prize for Book of the Year. Um, she teaches at Oxford, and tonight she's coming to us from Cornwall. So would you please welcome Jane Griffiths. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, and thank you too to everyone at Blood Axe um, for organising this event and to the audience for being here. I'd like to start by reading the first poem in the collection. It's called Waking and the title segues into the first line of the poem. Waking, the book you were reading called Night still fly-leaved to your fingers. The bedside light casting shadows like bison running at full stretch for centuries now. You know, of course, you've been dreaming of the cave's wide mouth and a small boat negotiating the underground stream to its receding source. You have the word bark on your tongue, the root of it twisted and solid in the shifty room as the thick of the current, the needlepoint eye of the creature in the eye of the hunt or the storm. Now, this book is um, in many ways a book of elegies. Um, there are elegies for people and for places, and there are also elegies for the unborn. And this next poem called Offspring is, I suppose, a slightly light-hearted take on the idea of not having children and the idea that that could be a choice rather than um, something not chosen. Offspring. Out above the pool, each time the black and white film rolls, the girl starts forward on the springboard, stutters a bit as she slips from frame to frame. Feet tense against its buoyancy, she casts off, herself wholly in her body as the world swings through 150 degrees around her. Fetal, she furls, then stretches for the water that parts for her fingertips subaqueous progress and all that follows. When we pause, rewind, and here she goes again, following her footprints to their promised up and over, until this slip, this decisive flicker of refusal, as she stands for all the mothers and their mothers before them, who carried daughters proud of their solitudes, whose sons were vital permission to leave off. And, oh, we ask, is this a negative? As the girl, paused on the rim of the board that's kicking with her weight, watches her friends on the far side scry for their children, one hand to their eyes, the other raising the flag of hope that springs eternal in the form of pale blue swim shorts. And, singular, turns out of the picture and says, take five. The next poem is um, an elegy for a, um, a friend who died at the very beginning of the first lockdown. It's a poem though that also draws very substantially on the disconcerting experience of living in a house that genuinely was falling down. 
and it pulls those two things together, I hope, um, through its title, Stet, which, as many of you will know, is um, a proofreader's command. Um, literally, it's Latin for let it stand. Um, so it's something a proofreader would write if they'd made a correction and then thought, no, actually, it was better the way it was before. So it's a command to put things back as they were. Stead. As conservationists tape hairs across a hairline crack in the plaster, as if the house will stand or fall by them. As someone at her attic desk writes stick, then fracture, then erases them. As swifts want vapour trails, as a plummeting cat twists in the final foot above the gravel and only a glitch of the eye says what was that. So this summer, in parenthesis, we are holding our breath collectively. Also, particularly, we are failing to connect was with is, in waiting between the here and now. As a writer takes her pen to strike a diagonal through the hole, writes keyboard, writes delete deletes them. Or as someone on the end of a bad line hesitates, not quite believing what they've heard, and says, could you just repeat? And then, with a wry lilt, as you were, as if. In the house that may or may not be falling still, someone writes that all the hairs on the back of the neck bristle. And there you are, in your sand shoes, grinning. I'll read two more, and these are both poems that are very much set in the place that I'm now speaking to you from, which is St Just in Penwith, in the very far west of Cornwall. Now, this isn't a coast um, where migrants are arriving. Um, it's a wreckers coast. It's not a good place for landing. Um, but like virtually everybody else. Of course, I've been thinking a lot about um, all the, the recent arrivals. And when here, I also inevitably think about the Atlantic, which is what I see from the window. Um, and particularly at night, it's a black expanse and set against it, the dancing lights of ships, the dancing lights of lighthouses and above them, the stars. And that setting, I think informed the thinking about migration. It's called Anchorage. Who, who, asks an owl, caught in the upturned bowl of night. At the valley's end, a neat triangle of sea oscillates slightly. Small granite houses along the ridge are groundwork, silhouetted and steady, so steady on their coordinates. They're a world away, from the illuminated ellipses offshore that ride at anchor, the botched craft that slip between, and behind them, below the horizon, the full weight of the globe spinning in its heavenly body of water, fringed with thorny valleys like these. Only when a cry goes up into the sky's anechoic margin of error, it means differently in different human tongues. And any which way, the next port of call. And this final poem is a lyric. Um, the valley that runs from this cottage down to the ocean is called Cot Valley and there's um, a brook that runs down it and this poem is called Cot Song and it's really the, the lyric that the brook might have sung. Cot Song. Loose-lipped, the lyric falls down through the leaves, singing its cot-song lullaby like birdsong, only of itself, the sound-rounded stones and the sky invisible above the canopy. Also, some head-turning rock doves and chuffs, perhaps, topsy in the air, it whistles up for them. Non-labial lip service, tripping fulsome off the tongue that is not I, and brooking no what? 
no interruption, but tumbling on down through all its tributaries to the ocean it sprang from and over and again. So someone at her desk in a skylit, skylit room above the valley, glancing up, calls back into the house. Listen, it's starting to rain. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Sorry about that blip there. Um, yes, Jane was reading from her new book, um, which has as its cover a painting by Kate Montgomery called Woman Sleeping by the Sea, which really gives the flavour of some of the poems you've just been hearing. And Kate Montgomery is actually watching this event tonight. Uh, so it's her first time that she's heard Jane reading from the book for which she did the cover, um, beautiful, for which she provided the beautiful cover painting. Uh, we've also got audience members from Ireland, France, Germany and Canada. And I'm sure the Canadian connection relates to our next poet, Shazia Qureshi, who is a Pakistani born Canadian poet and translator who's been living in London for many years now. Uh, she's coming to us tonight from Brixton. Um, she benefited from the wonderful Complete Works mentoring program, um, after which Ludax published her first collection, The Art of Scratching in 2015. Uh, her new book, The Glimmer, is a meditation on the time span of life illuminated by many voices set in an artist colony in Mexico. And she will say more about it. It's a very unusual book, a book with many voices um, speaking, and uh, it's a book with many perspectives. Um, so without any more ado, I'd like to say welcome to Shazia Qureshi. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, thank you. It's um, such a pleasure to be here virtually. I have to say, I haven't been anywhere in real life. Uh, <laughs> I mean, reading um, since before the pandemic. So I think that would be a shock. Um, uh, anyway, I'll I, I, I'll just get started. Um, so uh, this book is, I suppose, an extended narrative. Neil and I discussed, you know, we it, you can't really call it a collection because it's not individual poems, although there are individual poems within it. Um, the extended narrative, uh, most of it is from in the voice of a taxidermist who um, meditates on her work and um, and also, uh, you know, the afterlife and what remains of us afterlife. And um, as well as her voice, we have anagram poems, which are meant to replicate um, her work of taking apart and putting together um, because they are, uh, the form is from the um, uh, Ulipo group of French surrealists. And it's, um, at the anagram form where you take a word, which is the title, which in my case is the name of the animal, and all those letters can be used um, once, they can be used again, but in a word once. So you have a, a very um, a small palette, you have a very particular palette of sound and letters. Uh, and so, and also she's, they pay homage to the animals because that's what um, a lot of the taxidermy artists do. I see I've got a little bit of light coming. I'm just trying to make that a bit better. Um, and as well as the voice of the taxidermist, we have um, a ghazal singer. So there are ghazals and extracts of ghazals. And we have uh, the voices of artists, which come from uh, verbatim quotes from interviews, um, uh, from things they've said. Uh, and uh, they are generally things that really resonated with me. Uh, when I was struggling, um, you know, with this, uh, what do we call it, career? <laughs> um, definitely work uh, and making work that is not uh, always and not necessarily, um, you know, uh, monetarily um, rewarded. Uh, so, yes, uh, I'm blathering a bit, so I will just start. So this is the taxidermist. Her hands intent, precise thinking. Miracle how living works, stops. Careful labor to preserve, restore, what? Limbo, no. 
past and present perhaps, an imprint, a three-dimensional holding of memory, no, of one's being. She once heard someone say, this is craft, it lacks edge, advantage, power, urgency, force, gets up to shift thoughts. From the blue house next door, song, a voice testing lines as a tightrope walker tests for tension before stepping out onto the wire strung between two stopping places. My beloved is weather, she is crowd, rain shower, a day dawning generous, bright with birds. Streets freshly watered, a telephone line is strung as if pearled with white after white after white bird sound of a phone ringing. She remembers swimming in a river by her brother's house, the current cold, insistent. How once she let it carry her too far before climbing the high bank to walk back over pine needles, hard earth, stones. How he watched from a window until he saw her, red swimsuit flickering through the trees. A white mouse, too. What has a white mouse to show us? I meet him, white mute item. Fate, air hums with it. He was, he is. I sew him shut, wish him home. Um, and this is another anagram poem. Spiny pocket mouse. Minute moppet, eyes inky moons, toe tips pink, tiny stoic, once nosy, scooty, untie times not, postpone emptiness. Um, so next there's a ghazal and then um, there is text which is actually um, from, I suppose I consider it a part of a personal archive. So it comes from a book called Primer of Fly Fishing, which um, so a, lo a lot of the thread running through this book is um, grief for uh, the, a brother. And um, my brother had actually um, died, my younger brother, um, before, well, while I was writing the book and, you know, working up to it as well. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Ah, and um, he lived in Montreal. And when I was lost there after his funeral, I um, saw a book on fly fishing that I remember my father had as well. My father used to take um, I think he tried taking me fishing and I was really very interested, but he used to take my two brothers and they used to get up at dawn and it was something that they did a lot. And then um, my brother Asad used to take um, his sons, well, his younger son, Michael, in particular. Uh, and so this book was sort of a Bible for them both. And uh, I noticed that it was, it had been, um, I noticed it had been published in the year of my birth, which I thought was interesting. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to read a puzzle and and then the, the bit anywhere that there's talk about fishing <laughs> is coming from that book. Uh, so this is the puzzle singer who the taxidermist hears. So she's living in an artist colony, which is very like uh, a residency, an artist residency. And I think, Christine, if that's you from Canada. Um, so I met Christine, who's a textile artist uh, there at this very strange artist residency um, and so I imagine so it became the setting the house that we lived in became the setting of where the taxidermist is living and she hears singing from next door but I'm not going to sing without you here without your voice yesterday was lost I moved through hours it's no use today is lost if life's a stage the theater's dark the actors left Lines forgotten, set abandoned, play script lost. All night I wrote to you, awoke to find the pages gone, the words that could have saved us irrevocably lost. Through the open window, a leaf, green as hope, almost enters. 
a rush of wind, it drifts away, lost. My beloved in an armchair drifts elsewhere, what to do but watch and hope, believe, love outweighs loss. So I imagine that this, um, that the Ghazal singer, um, that her beloved, who I imagined as a woman, was um, ill, perhaps. Um, you know, the way that we bring in uh, things that are going on in our own lives in a way that feels very, sat feels very satisfying to be able to, to gather these things in. Um, and I'm going to end with this last page. I won't call it a piece. It kind of looks like that. Day eight. She works painstakingly removing pin feathers. A memory, her brother tying flies fish hook in a vice, tongue tip between lips, silk feather, his precise fingers. She takes his book from the shelf. The fan wing, white, wide upright wings curve outward, well tied, a very beautiful fly. The spent wing represents the fly exhausted after its breeding flight, more sparsely hackled, will settle further into the surface film of the water like a dead or dying creature. Thank you, thank you, Shazia. Um, we're now, our third reader is Greta Stoddart. Um, Greta published her first collection in 2001 and it won the Geoffrey Faber Memorial Prize. Um, she published her second collection, uh, Sa uh, Salvation Jane in 2008 with Anvil uh, and then she moved to Blood Axe after Anvil shut up shop and Blood Axe published her third collection, Alive Alive O, and we're now publishing her fourth full. Um, she is in uh, Devon. Um, full asks lots of questions and um, it's a very quizzical book and it's a book about self and knowledge and you know the whole of the human condition really. Um, so I think we should ask, um, ask Greta to say more about it. So please welcome Greta Stoddart. Um, thank you very much for that, Neil. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, virtual place. Yesterday, I planted a tree is a line I wrote this morning. It also happens to be the truth, the truth. A train swooshes past, a cow big and solid stares out. What am I doing in this field is what I have the cow saying because of that look she has, which has something of me at this moment in it. Shall I carry on? Look at the tree and think of ways of conjuring it, even though it's already there. Come the afternoon, all this will appear faintly ridiculous, like the moon in daytime. What in the world are you doing? Is what I have the moon saying, because of that look she has, which has something of me at this moment in it. Come cow, come moon, oh, come the afternoon, when I will get up and comb my hair in a way I never have before to see if it makes any difference. I scoop dirt from my fingernails. Yesterday was a good day. My hands push deep into the earth. Before you um, begin writing a book, I, I find that I have to write a lot of poems. Um, I don't even know if they're poems really, but they're, they're writings really, as you find your way towards where, well, where your writing is going to take you next. And sometimes a poem writes itself or you write a poem and you don't fully understand it, but it seems to point the way towards possibly other poems to maybe your next step. And that poem that I 
I just read was, was that one for this collection. Adult education. She is old enough to be my mother. I'm afraid of what she'll say next. She has what she herself would never say, because it is a cliche, a formidable intellect. There are things in her life that have made her sad and formless. Everything falls. I find myself clucking and cooing over her. Once I touch her arm, I am a fool. I am afraid of her saying to me, that is simply not true, and me knowing it. My mind jumps up and down in its bag and wants to get out when she comes in the room. When she says my name, which is not at all often, I feel briefly of some worth. Once she said to me, I should like to hear you on Auden. And I lay awake composing a cold and brilliant talk called About Suffering, which I had myself telling her casually over tea in the canteen. There are things in her life, but there's never time. I watch her shuffle out with her plastic bags full of 14th century Italian poetry, which is the class she goes to after mine. Anyone who um, has had a close relationship with a child will know perhaps that um, intense period of questioning they seem to go through around the ages of um, four, five, six. Um, it's actually quite a repetitive kind of question because it, it comprises the word why over and over again. Why, why, why? It's a good Russian doll of whys. And who knows where you'd end up if you actually were able to answer every single one. But I, I find as adults sometimes we're, we're loath to say, I don't know, um, maybe especially to a child. What is a question but the beginning of something? And what is a child, if not a beginning, alive and hurtling on towards another question? Here comes one now, out of the dark and full of sleep, stepping into the light. And no sooner is it out, and you begin to form the first words of your response, then the eyes glaze over. Of course, it was enough to ask the question. Will you be so good as to let it stand there? in the wide open, not knowing? Will you allow it to grow without your need to tether and train? Will you remain just so and allow it to be about to become, like a flower begins to open, even though sunlight is not the answer? only the reason. This is uh, the last poem I'm going to read in this set. Um, and I, I, so I'll give the last, last poem um, alert, but also I'd like to give an alert that's a little bit longer than the others. It's a, it's a two-pager. Um, I think it's nice for the listener to um, have a sense of when it's going to end. perfect field. But then I think having all the answers would be a bit like being dead. What would you need to live for? You'd be somewhere no one else was. You'd be beyond questioning. But 
being beyond questioning is not the same as having all the answers. It just means you have been removed or have removed yourself from the possibility of interrogation, like God or an absolute ruler, or if you think about it, a cat. But to go back to being dead for a moment, when someone dies, don't you feel they, simply by that something of a miraculous vanishing act, know more than you do? But not just anything or everything. It's as if they arrived in a place of deep invulnerability, knowing only what they need to know. There's a walk we do where we pass through what I like to call the perfect feel. It's up on a high ridge and stretches out in all directions. And the grass is bright green and neither too short nor too long. The children laugh at my perfect field and cry, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect field and run through it, chasing the dog and laughing and laughing. I stand in the field and think, this is like being in a place beyond suffering, being so high and with such far reaching views. But even here, you can imagine a scaffold, a badly shot deer. When I am nowhere near the field, I see people kneeling in the bright grass that stretches out in all directions. There's the light on their faces they do not feel, and the wind that ripples through the grass doesn't lift their hair or clothes in any way. I don't recognize a single face. No one knows anyone. I don't want to see those people kneel like that in the grass and not feel the sun on their faces. I don't want them to show me how in removing themselves to the perfect field, they have come to know what they know and cannot hear the laughing. Thank you. Thank you, Greta, for that beautiful reading. Um, we're now going to hear from Jane Griffiths again. Uh, so, Jane. Thank you, Neil. Um, in this second set, I'm just going to read two poems, but the second of them is the title sequence um, of the book, Little Silver. And this first poem is one that seems to me to lead quite naturally into it. Um, this first poem, Moving the House, is one that I wrote after visiting my parents in Edmonton in Canada, as it happened. Um, and we passed a, a Quaker meeting house, which was about to be removed from its existing location in the middle of the city and moved to the very edge of the city. And I found that a very disconcerting thought. Around the same time, I was rereading um, Arthur Ransom's Pigeon Post. And so I had the thought, what would a homing pigeon do if its house were removed? Moving the house. Up for removal, this small wooden house is cut loose from its footings and transported bodily over 20 miles to stand in perfect semblance of itself off the edge of the city's map. A different quality of silence about it. So too, planes settle on tarmac. So too, pilgrims who emerge from under the wings with out of kilter backpacks overbalancing carry themselves lightly as if in transit still, paused between descent and takeoff in a place whose nights are flocks of birds, pulsing like irregular star signs that shear along dotted lines and separate as they remember not the path they've flown, but where they started from, the keeps and coops of friable slats and chicken wire, 
the memory cells they've banked on since birth. Today, as ever, tumbling from the sky on the long leash of home, only to fall unerringly through the heart of the want, where the house is gone. And the title sequence um, of the book, Little Silver, is also very much um, a poem about a house that's gone. It's my childhood home in Exeter, which I discovered um, the year before the pandemic, when I went back to see it, had been demolished, um, and evidently quite recently demolished, since there was um, a pile of rubble there. And I walked away from it down the road I would have taken as a young child to playgroup and to primary school, and past the end of a lane called Little Silver. And I remembered I'd always been fascinated by it and thought, well, I should, I should go and look. So I went, walked down it and came out into a clearing with some 18th century houses on one side and some trees in the middle, some silver birches, and pulled up short and thought, I've no memory at all of being here before, but I dream this place. It's the place I come to um, in nightmares when I need a safe space, you know, when you can will a safe space in a nightmare, and this is it. And so coming across that immediately after finding that my actual home had been demolished um, seemed something that I needed to make sense of, and I wrote the poem. I realised after writing it that um, the name Little Silver probably comes from the Latin silver, meaning copse or wood. And so that connects this, this place, Little Silver, with that line um, of Dante's, the Selva Oscura, the dark wood, um, where he writes at the beginning of the Inferno, um, midway through the journey of life, I found myself in a dark wood um, with the clear path ahead of me lost. And I think the poem, even subconsciously, was attempting to hold all of those thoughts together and is also trying to make sense of the attempt to make sense of them. Because it's a sequence, I'll do what Peter Scuppam used to do, which is hold it up for you so you can see how long it is. It is this page and then that page and that half page. And I'll read it straight through. Little Silver. What would it mean to write a house on a hill, to have that lucidity to start from? One word following another as feet fall in a drift of leaves, making out a pattern that is real entirely as the path you summon to return and the house in its airiness, its springboarded corridor and view of a sky bright slingback of river, if it weren't for the trees that is. The path home always comes down to this, Little Silver, what you were born with. Little Silver, what you were born with, a clutch of talents, a clearing in the wood. A charm slipped under tree roots, promise kept in that dream you have of pursuit down red brick terraces to sudden spaciness, where the road opens on long grass, silver birches, and you pause in near recognition then escape down a side street you couldn't have made up. If you could leave off here, you said. Little Silver, a true and double passage. Little Silver, a true and double passage, a small gift of tongues to take you out into the world's roundabout ways and crossed purposes to talk of leaving, to talk of anything but. The house on the hill, always above and beyond the word, impervious, its paper white walls and indelible ink roof line drawing the eye through leaves at the turn of the lane, where the sky is clearing. Little silver, the coin leading home. Little silver, the coin leading home up the hill past the unhinged garages of Taddeford and through its redstone arch to a road slipper as a stream brimming over or rain going under the stream, over, again. If you could leave off here, you said. Little Silver, what you come back to when your own path home leads only to this, a blank space, a little silvering between the trees. 
a little silvering between the trees, skylight where no light should be. A level sight and rubble that was the house on the hill, its singing slate and blaze white gable, its wood framed cavernousness. The unselved space, impossibly too small, for the house that you still see standing above the valley, that you lift and lodge in the eight rooms, store cupboard, loft and corridor of the heart, that you carry off quietly down the hill to little silver. What would it mean to write a house on a hill, to write it and see it standing, singly, without overspill, to have that lucidity to start from. Not to need the words for it, seeing it stand alone. Not to chase the shape of it through the wood to the point there's no unknowing, how its unbeings blazed in black and white between the trees. And not to repeat this, not to turn from the shocked hole in the hill to the broken charm that is Little Silver. Little Silver, the long way home. Little silver, a kind of hedginess. Little silver, a name for the unknown. Little silver, the house in mind alone. Little silver, a faint and narrow passage that's means to an end, a paper trail back to the void of what you were born with. The writing that won't put house and hill together. The slight of heart, safe house that was never your own. And the silver unleaving where you turn and leave off. Gilgarren is the lost house on the hill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, we're now going to leave that world and enter the world of Shazia's book. So would you please welcome again Shazia Qureshi. Thank you, Neil. Um, well, I'd like to think there is a sort of halo above me. I, I tried to fix the light, but I couldn't. Um, um, that was so beautiful, Jane. I was just really, uh, really in that world. Uh, and I love the idea that you can, um, that you can bring a place into your dreams, into nightmares, particularly. I wish I knew that. Uh, so I'm going to read from the, oh, I'm just going to start my timer. I'm going to read from uh, towards the end of the book without it sounding too much like an ending, except at the end. Um, and so um, I think I mentioned that about, and I'm sure it's the same for, you know, for Jane and Greta, um, about how you, you know, of course, writing, you bring aspects of your life. And and I also like being able to fictionalize um, you know, having uh, fact and truth and fiction all in the same place. And I've also really loved um, bringing in um, so things that were going on at the time. So I was um, swimming a lot. I started swimming in cold water, particularly when my um, brother was diagnosed with terminal illness and when he was dying and after that. And that just really saved me. And actually a lot of the book, didn't actually write the book until about a year after he died. Um, but a lot of the book, the thinking about the book was written and some of the actual writing of the book in my head uh, was written underwater when I was swimming at Brockwell Lido. Um, and actually the title, The Glimmer, comes from, uh, you know, you're swimming and I'm sure it's it might be the same in some rivers but in a pool um, and looking down and the sun suddenly comes out and you get that incredible kind of network um, just that glimmering on the pool floor uh, which felt to me like it like hope or like life itself I suppose uh, so that's actually where the title came from um, and just a couple of other things are the notes. Um, if you have or will get a copy of my book, the notes are really important at the back. And there's something that I kind of almost love the most in, in the book. Um, and I will be uh, quoting. Um, so in it, they're always in quotation marks when I quote from uh, artists or um, uh, anyone. I'm trying to think of anyone else I quoted from. Um, 
And uh, some of the artists that I'm going to be quoting from in the next section are the um, origami artist Akira Yoshizawa, the light artist Kumi Yamashita, um, the Italian sculptor Alberto Giacometti, I think that's it. Uh, and then I'll be ending with an elegy. Day 23, walking to the bookshelf cafe, street after street leads to mountains, sky. In the courtyard, an old man folds brown paper, sharp folds and soft folds. She remembers after the seawall ferry disaster, people folded 1,000 white paper cranes for each child who perished. He sees her looking, calls her over. Creation requires time. It took me 23 years to develop this cicada from initial inspiration to the full development of folds. Every creation emerges from a series of variations around the same theme until it expresses its own clearly perceptible character. Everywhere people are making, a woman projects shadows on the far wall. For me, shadows symbolize another dimension of life, perhaps something even more real than its holder. In a shadow, there is little information for the viewer. It is basically a void. Everything rests on the right light. One will make double shadows, another very crisp shadows or blurry ones. Do the shadows we cast say something about us? the distorted angling of the sun behind us. The more you fail, the more you succeed. When everything is lost and you go on, suddenly you have the feeling, illusion or not, something new has opened up. The form is always the measure of the obsession. That was Giacomo T. Um, ah, um, I was also, and I and I am now, uh, in the process of translating uh, the poems of the Mexican poet, journalist, and activist, Susana Chavez Castillo, who was murdered in 2011 for her um, raising awareness and seeking justice for the victims of femicidio in Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, where she was from. Um, and uh, And so, um, there are a few extracts from one of her poems that I've been translating. Day 26. Radio on, blanket round her, a woman speaks. In the arms of your voice, with lips half earth, half night, a heart of dust and another of wind. I'm speaking of this love navigating through fog, this love this love. She slips in and out of sleep. I find you sometimes in a face you never had, in impermanence you didn't deserve, and silence lifts its head to look at me. Now we return at night, trees hold on to their birds, and tiredness extends its tongue to sing in our ears. Okay, and I'm going to end with um, ooh, um, one, anag one anagram poem, because um, I really like this one, and then uh, an elegy at the end. Nine-banded armadillo. Dear old one, mild armored animal, bedallioned, medallioned, droll-eared, adored elder, Millennia born, iron demeanor abandoned. Dreamland, a liminal realm, a lonelier ballad. And, um, and the last poem. How it begins. A man and a woman press close as flowers press to the pages of a book. Her pale foot slips from its sandal in the vaulted space of a kiss, and the way his hands hold her face, 
is the way leaves hold a bud before it flowers. Now this, a woman alone in a crowd watches a strong brown river struggle to hold the whale that swam down the city's glittering throat and the air presses heavy as grief against her enormous softness. And if a woman and a boy stand before a glass coffin that holds the bones of a northern bottlenose whale, the softness of his hand will be enormous. As she tells him how a story that began with a kiss, despite the enormous hole at its heart, can hold a boy. And a river that began with rainwater or snowmelt can briefly hold a whale before letting it go to spill from its mouth into the ocean, stories of whales and boys and all it has known. Thank you. Thank you, Shazia, that was lovely. Um, we're now going to hear from Greta Stoddart uh, for her second set. Thank you, Neil. Um, consider the mornings. Consider the mornings we've woken into and you turn to me or I to you and why it is I still prefer to wake alone. It's something about the light, how it brings a certain clarity of tone after the weight and dread of the night. Consider the, what, the night, the one time we see ourselves in space, so wonder what we are. How, for example, the fundamental laws of physics can't explain the on-off beauty of your face, but can how the electricity I find in stroking you is there too in a star. Consider electricity and at the same time, the eternal mystery, how science is only possible because of it, how nature likes to complicate itself inside the vast simplicity of its plan. Think I of an insect, love of a man, how compound and complex Consider the last time we'll ever have sex, you and I, how we live among things destined to die, that man's love, that insect I. Consider your being destined to die, how of course I'll cry, but at the same time think how different it feels when taken outside, how commonplace and wide. It'll be something about the light compared to how the mind is so compound and complex. Consider the eternal mystery and how it might be absolutely devoid of love and yet, how potential is that yet? Consider a temperate, self-possessed approach to disaster, how absurd and yet potential is that clarity of tone. Consider that tone, the one to take, the morning when I or you will wake alone, and it'll no longer be a matter of preference, nor will it be a disaster, but commonplace and wide, as you or I will step outside, where something about the light after the weight of the night will make us wonder what we are, and at the same time, how electricity in a star is only possible because of the eternal, yet vast simplicity of the plan. Think I of an insect, love of a man. Um, so the book is called Fool. Uh, so it's uh, a lot about knowing and not knowing and how we know 
the things that we know? Do we know them partly because we want to know them? We want to believe them or in them. But also, I think we know partly only what our mental or sensory equipment allows us to know. And I think the speaker of this next poem weighs these two things up. She's aware possibly that they are limitations on the surface, but I think she's trying to kid herself or possibly the person she's talking to that they're not necessarily limitations. Spell. Only this morning you swore you saw something swift and white fly through the night and land on the gate in the dark. And now you're saying you think you saw a bluebell begin to realize what it was among the many, which is a singular, but not a special part. Why am I not surprised? We always think beyond what we can see. Like now, I think I know what you're thinking, but it feels like a curse or some sort of spell that we can't seem to tell how things are from how we make them out to be. What's real? Touch me and you'll know I'm just another thing pushing up out of the earth, claiming it's one mortal place. Wanting to hear again what you believe came flying through the night with its wide open face. Walking into church is like walking into someone's mind. I don't know how to think or be, how to look in the slant light. I'm being watched. Am I being watched? What is being thought of me? I want to lay myself down at the feet of someone who might do something. What am I saying? Who is listening? Only the silence that's been made over the years by those who've come to weigh their grief in the air left the light thick with it. Say it, you are not alone. I am not alone, I say. Would you take me in, old thing? Or forgive me at least, for I know not what I'm doing, planting a candle in this melting, glimmering tray. And this is my uh, last poem. My life came up to me and said, I want to ask you about courage. It wasn't a good time. I was kneeling at the iris bed. I'd been waiting weeks to do this, to not think about anything but the irises and my need to clear, clear them of all the nettles and wild grasses. My need to cut a border, look out the window and feel a deep satisfaction at the sight of the dark dug over soil, broken now and open, ready for the rain to enter, for the green sheaths to push up, unfurl their purple flags to the air. Think you have more because of the years or less. And I looked at my life as I've always done, askance, skeptical, and said, I'm not sure I ever had it. I'm not sure you asked for it. Things happened that made me 
sad as the next person. But my choices were clear to me and I was always able to make them. Do you know how lucky you are? My life said, placing a hand on my shoulder as I looked down, scraping my trowel with a stick. I have no idea why the tears came. I didn't know who to thank, or if even thanks were due. Surely not to my life, who I could see now was simply passing by. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greta. Um, do stay there because we're now going to move into our discussion. And so I'd like to invite Shazia and Jane to turn on their uh, videos and their audio. Uh, thank you. Um, the audience, uh, just also to alert the audience, if you want to send any questions through, do put them in the feed. And afterwards, if you want to order any of the books, which we hope you will, just scroll down on the YouTube page and you'll find links to order them there. Um, we've got a lot of poets in the audience tonight. Um, Claire Shaw uh, talking about the, the work being awesome. And I think that we've just heard three stunning readings. Uh, Jane Clark, Lydia Harris, Sophie Heitz Herpsheimer, Matthew Cayley, thank you very much for joining us and thank you to all the other audience to joining us tonight. Um, one thing that's really struck me in the readings that we've heard tonight is the way in which all your collections have threads running through them. They're not, I mean, obviously Shazia's book isn't a conventional collection, it's not a collection of separate poems, but then nor are nor is Greta's book, nor is Jane's book. Um, you have all these connections and threads running through them that hold them together. Um, and in the case of Shazia's book, because I saw it in various versions, I could actually see in the different drafts uh, aspects of how she was pulling together what felt like almost a tapestry uh, appropriately for what she was writing about. And in many ways, I think, um, some of the ways you've structured the books are quite musical. You know, you, it's like all these different um, light motifs all coming together and making a whole. Uh, so I'd like to ask you really, how conscious were you of, of that making that you were doing in the course of writing? Was it organic? Um, was it planned? Did it just come together? Um, perhaps we could start with Jane or Greta on, on that. Jane? Okay. <laughs> um, I think it was a gradual process. Um, I think I find that I tend to start writing not knowing um, what, if anything, the theme is going to be of a collection. And then slowly certain threads emerge. I think what I wasn't conscious of till the very end was that the, um, the work around um, the house and the work around childlessness actually had connections. Um, and I think that didn't perhaps become apparent until um, right at the end, I added in some of the um, elegies for actual people and then realised that in a sense elegy was a theme um, but also that um, kind of making something of the material that you've been given was a theme um, and at that point late on it became a conscious process but until relatively late on I think it was more a question of looking at individual poems, liking them, not liking them, um, and then the, the shaping of the whole and, and realising what the whole was about and indeed that it was about something um, was, yeah, really the, the, the last kind of bit, um, not, not something that happened at an early stage. Um, I don't know, Greta, does that, does that speak to how it works for you or not at yes, all? Yes, very, very um, similar, actually. 
um, it feels familiar what you're describing there. I think what was slightly different for me with this book was um, I had a sense that what I was writing uh, did all belong together, but I wasn't I still wasn't quite sure what what it was that was holding them together. So I did a rather sort of a prosaic thing, if you like, and I just decided to go through the collection and uh, looking at the words that came up and uh, the verb know or variants thereof, knowing, unknowing, unknown, came up um, 48 times. I mean, at that point, you think I should go and just edit, edit some of those, yeah, change the words a bit. Um, but more than anything, it just showed me really that um, what, what I'd sensed in, in my body, in a way, uh, that they did all cohere, they were all part of the same thing. But now I had the verb, if you like, to, uh, to attach um, to, or to, to stand as some sort of uh, central structure. And that really helped me, actually. And once I had this whole idea of no know and knowing, I thought, yes, yeah, this is what this is about. Then, and then the, the figure of the fool just came uh, up for me as a way of uh, exploring this idea of, um, of, of, of knowing. Yeah, I wonder if Shazia wants to join in this conversation about how she, how she um, brought it all together, amazing chorus of voices. Um, yes, well, I, I do, it, it wasn't very planned as Neil, Neil can tell you, he, I think <laughs> one of the earliest drafts, I, I was very panicked. I hadn't written for a few years because of my brother's illness and then his death and um, I hadn't been able to write. And so a very panicked way I sent um, something and it wasn't even clear what it was, but I, I know that my sort of obsessions for going back at least eight years, I'd become a bit obsessed with dolls and then, I'd been collecting because I'd had a bit of a crisis, um, been collecting any time I, I, I would read curator's notes of when I'd go to see an exhibition and uh, anything I, I read about an artist talking about their work that resonated with me, I would just write it down. So I had all these bits of paper. Um, so I knew it would be something to do with making. Uh, and then the taxidermist, I was looking at all different kinds of artists and I found these taxidermy artists and then that just really fit with, um, I suppose, the grief I was feeling and, and thinking about very much about what remains of us, because it's not just memory, but the way that, um, so so all these things, and then more and more things came in, like um, the origami artist, and, uh, and at the last minute, I watched this incredible film about whale song and culture and, you know, how whale song travels um which then just came into it came into the book as well so for me it was sort of a, a gathering a, a kind of gathering in of um, people and also um ideas and thoughts that had become very precious to me and and which I wanted to honor and and also to sort of keep close I suppose so uh, so then it was just a case of um of structuring it, which um, I have to say, Neil also helped me with that <laughs> because, because it's that thing of you don't want to say too much, you don't want to make it too, mm. you don't want to make it hang together too clearly, but then there's a fine line between, you know, what's going on. Uh, so yeah, yeah, very much. Um, I think like Jane, just sort of uh, more organic, uh, quite organic, but also like yours, Greta. I mean, it's, um, I th sometimes we don't notice what we've, been sort of thinking about so much until we look look back and then think oh I seem to have been really obsessed or interested with this mm. so yeah I, I thought it was really interesting with your two books I, I found lots of connections actually um, and what I was trying to think uh, how, how to best to express this and it's, it's how both books in their diff very different ways handle the material and the immaterial in a way, the spirit and the body, and it goes well, not just the elegies, but the, the the other sort of themes of the book of something that you do you hold like the doll in Shazia's case and the and the stuffed animals. There's a wonderful line I wonder if I can remember it uh, um, about this. This it's not death; it's just life held in the holding of time or something like that. And then I think of in Jane's poem, there's a lot of jewels and necklaces, and they which seem to sort of hold presence 
Um, I think in her case, it's sort of the female line, you know, she holds these these jewels and these necklaces in an unglazed pot, I think, at one point. And you just feel that these, these dead things, if you like, um, contain something very alive in, in, in both your collections. I'm interested in that. I don't, this isn't really a question. This is just me waffling on. So I don't know if you wanted to say something about, um, about that. Either of you. All your books are really relate to mortality, don't they? Mm, yeah. That's the thing that came over to me very strongly hearing the three of you read together all very different perspectives on mortality. Yes, I really noticed that. And sometimes it was very surprising. Um, yeah, very surprising. It was just a realization towards the end of a poem like um, Greta, your poem, uh, I think it was, yeah, Perfect Field to me was sort of really kind of beautifully devastating. Um, and uh, and something also about um, movement for both of your books, Greta and Jane, something about the way of the mind moving, um, uh, Jane with a uh, little silver. It's it's so beautiful in the in the way that the form moves, but also the way the mind and the way that it seems to take us through a landscape where sort of. Um, moves and looks back and then goes on and then at the end there's a kind of constant returning and um, with uh, Greta's um, oh which one was it I think second nature it's the way I was just trying to think what is this it was a very sort of slow and fluid movement it made me think of something like a movement of the mind of thoughts and images it made me think about uh, the image uh, about the flight of a bird, maybe the way it sort of goes and then swoops and then changes direction, but all kind of so fluid. So um, I'm sorry, I've just gone on to a very different tack, but something about movement in both of your books to me felt, and something about pace as well, to me felt very um, something that was in common um, to both of them. But um, just ignore that and let's get back to Neil's original <laughs> question. Yes, I mean, the house, I mean, houses run through all your books, don't they, Jane? Uh, house mm -hmm. and home. And your, your dislocated life that you spent your early years in Exeter, in Devon, that you're writing about here, but then you were suddenly moved to Holland to a whole other environment um, and then came back later. Um, is that life experience something, you know, that, that makes houses such potent symbols for you in your work? Yes, I think it absolutely is. Um, losing that particular house um, and, and particularly because of the slightly sort of unfortunate way in which we moved from a house with a garden to a very small house in a new town. It wasn't just a change of country, it was a sort of complete change in the way of being. So it, it, it set up the original house as um, a kind of perfect house um, in a way that it kind of patently wasn't realistically, except in my mind, it absolutely is. Um, and yes, the idea of, of the house and the house as the safe place um, has I think been something that's, that's always um, come back in my writing. I think also the other thing that move did, um, which ties into what Shazia was saying just now, um, because it was a move from um, being a monolingual English child to being effectively bilingual in Dutch and English, um, was make me very aware of language kind of as a thing and as a thing that you do move through and a thing that you can use. Um, and I think that's something that I saw in both your books as well. Um, Greta, I noticed how um, I think it's in performance. Um, the speaker quite literally pulls out the word defenestration. <laughs> and um, I won't do justice to this, but it says, I am going to think about it or use it quite coldly without thinking about all the following things which then come in. So there's no separating the word from its, its, material, its material connotations. Um, and I think, Shazia, I found a similar sort of sense in particularly your anagram poems, um, where there is no thought without the particulars of the language. And I was really interested in the way both of you um, 
kind of root what you're saying in the particulars of the words that you're using and that you're also so aware that that's what you're doing and I really enjoyed that um, among many things in in both your books. I'd just like to go back to that house thing because that really struck me Jane in, in your book and this, I just wrote so many quotes about this house thing of the long leash of home the heart of the want where the house is gone and this idea that the house is always above and beyond the word you know the house in a way stands for all longing really doesn't it for all everything that we once had or lost I mean poetry is lost isn't it so they say um, and your your poems especially your home poem um, seem to really speak that truth Yes, I think one of the things that's happening in that poem, um, as, as Neil knows, um, I've written about that house rather a lot in most of my books. It keeps coming back and keeps coming yeah. back. And there was something, um, well, something about seeing it literally not being there anymore mm. that really made me ask, what actually was I doing? I was, in a sense, in my mind, preserving it, but clearly I wasn't preserving it. So it really brought home the question of what poetry is actually doing. Um, how can it speak to loss? How can it make things stand as they were? Um, mm. And if it can't, what is it doing? What's it for? Um, mm. And I think the last line of the poem, Gilgarin is the lost house on the hill, made me think, I wonder if I'll now stop writing about it because actually every <laughs> single poem I've ever written about it is just saying that really. So now I can stop. <laughs> um. uh, something else in your, in your collections is voice. I mean, Greta, you, 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 you had theatre training and in many of your poems, you're using different speakers, aren't you? Uh, and obviously in, in Charles's book, um, different voices are very much part of the whole construction of it. Um, how, how conscious are you in terms of using different voices? Well, my theatre training was uh, silent. Um, oh. didn't speak. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not quite sure where that leads your question, Neil, but... Oh, it, was, um, it, was, was it mime then? <laughs> mime, well, it, I mean, I hesitate to use the word mime because people immediately think of Marcel Marceau and it wasn't quite that Mm. Say restrictive, but it was more um, using the body, you know, physical expression uh, long mm. before you open your mouth to say something. So I learned a huge amount actually about silence when I was at that drama school um, in Paris. But uh, so that doesn't really help you with voices. I'm, I'm not, I'm not aware. I don't know if the other two are Jane and Shazia are aware of putting on voices. But, but but in your poems, you I mean, all, all of you t often talk about the speaker. You're, the, the speaker of the poem is not the I necessarily. It's not necessarily you. You want to set it up as a, as a speaker that's not the poet, don't you? Yeah, I, I think when I discovered that that as a as a way of writing, it was hugely freeing. You know, with the courtesan sequence, because um, I was just so tired. Of, of my own I, of just I being just me, um, just started to feel like navel gazing. But the fact that I could still inhabit parts of um, uh, other voices, um, I just really, I really love doing that. And and with the um, with the artists, you know, it is lit it's literally their words, so it's their voices. So that for me was. Um, was really easy but I and I love with having you know I often like to just use the third person rather than I or or when I do use I the I like for the I to not be me or to not completely be me I, I really like to play with um you know with that um kind of autobiography and and fiction and just to make it uh, because there's something uh you know and sometimes uh, there's a segment about um, my brother and swimming at a river near my brother's house and it was just sometimes I would be really missing my brother and I would to be able to imagine this scenario was just, which just gave me great pleasure and I love to be able to to just make the world as I as I would like it to be so um yeah so I love 
using other using persona and using other voices that are very often elements of me, if not completely me. Um, I don't know how you find that, Jane. Um, yes, I think that's that's important. Um, not to um, have people assume that an I in a poem is to be fully identified um, with the writer of the book. Um, and in that, that poem, Cot Song, that I read, um, there's a moment that, where the voice says, that is not I. And I was quite consciously thinking at that point about sort of acad academic debates about lyric and should lyric be considered as a highly personal short utterance um, with intense emotion? Or is it much more to do with the play of sound? Um, and the idea of, of writing almost as the brook was to say, no, it is much more to do with the play of sound and sticking in that it is not I was a kind of um, gesture towards spelling that out in the middle of it, um, almost as, as a joke. I thought actually, um, Shazia, there was a point in one of your poems um, where one of your speakers says something about, um, yes, they are always asking me, as a Muslim artist, and do you believe in Islam? Just look at my work and talk about that. And I thought that really spoke to that question. Um, if people really fully identify the speakers in the work as the poet, then there's always going to be that thing of, oh, so last Saturday you went to Sainsbury's, and so I can see that in that line. Um, and it just, doesn't work because it takes away the autonomy of the thing that is made. The fact that the thing is, that is made is is never um, an unmediated utterance. Um, and yeah. I think, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, and that's so funny. I mean, I love foiling. I hadn't even thought that someone might think that was me because those are actually the mm -hmm. words of the miniature painter Imran Qureshi. Um, and, you know, he was talking about that, obviously, because he's Pakistani as well, and people would always ask him within the top context of being a, a Muslim. Um, and that actually did resonate with me the way that, uh, you know, asking, um, well, can you speak now as a Muslim writer, artist, you know, which is ludicrous. Who says, can you speak as a Christian um, artist to, uh, you know, to anyone, and I think he sort of said something like that, which I, I then took out. Um, I hadn't even thought that someone might think it's me, so that gives me even more pleasure to think that might sort of foil people's <laughs> ideas of, of you know what's you know who the what is belongs to the writer and what is belongs to someone else. Um, mm. But I love that. I love that idea, idea of playing, you know, with with expectation. Yeah, I've just actually thought of a thing um, in um, 16th century um, rhetorical training, um, which I think speaks to this and also, to my mind, really speaks to your poems, Greta, because like Neil, I also thought, gosh, there's a lot of really beautiful voicing going on here. And the 16th century rhetorical training thing is um, putting the case. So if you were being taught rhetoric, um, two of you would be opposed, one against the other, and you would each be given one side of a debate, and then you'd be told to switch. Um, and so there's always a sense that you are not speaking for yourself. You are kind of um, learning the skills of, of debating and learning verbal dexterity. And I think with, with your poems, Greta, um, you know, beginning consider or, um, God, I've now lost the quotes, but there were several of your poems where I felt you were kind of setting up the scene as one where there was a, a kind of debate, a way of saying, this is one way of seeing, that's another way of seeing, or here the speaker of the poem is seeing someone else who is seeing a third thing and that's being mediated between the two. And it's so, it's so beautifully mediated that it felt to me that they were, yeah, really consciously crafted verbal artifacts and that, was a lot to do with voice. Um, but... I, I don't know how much conscious thought went into it, but um, certainly I, I 
often get a line, I'm sure this is familiar to you, and the line, uh, the sound and the shape of the line is often what leads me on. So I, I follow that really. And so quite often it is the first line, even it, it might not end up being the first line, but it's the first line that, that, that gives me the voice, if you like. I like this idea of voicing. Uh, I like that. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I think that's that's maybe where the voices come. I'm just alert to these different voices, which I think are, are just parts of me. And just to hear you say that, Jane, I just think more than my other books, this one is me talking to myself or talking to different parts of me and thinking on the page, you know, it's thinking things through. Um, so I suppose it's my my oh, my various thinking voices and 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 slightly um, shaping them differently depending on what it is that I'm 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 talking about or want to look at. Also, in in full, you've used a lot more different sorts of forms, haven't you, Greta? Some mm. of which are your own invention in terms of how you've created these stanzas and different kinds mm. of movement in yeah. some some places using prose. Um, but very unusual um, forms. Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it, Neil? I don't, again, I wasn't a, a decision. The poems just, as well as me sort of thinking, if you like, they were also intensely physical. I was thinking a lot about my physical theatre training, I think, um, on and off in the writing of this. I kept going back to things that I'd learned, things that I'd experienced there through the body. So these poems were like, well, I want to be shaped like this. I, I don't want just to stay on that left margin and be in, you know, tercets and quatrains. I, there was almost like the, 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 the thought, uh, the propulsion was want, wanted to be shaped somehow and shaped differently. Um, according again to 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 what was being said, so it just happens. But it's quite interesting when suddenly this poem sort of fell in a diagonal shape uh, across the page. I thought, "Whoa, well, wonder why it's doing that." And then I realised in the end, it just one, there was a spotlight on this person um, at the end of the poem. And you know, in a way, sometimes you let these things happen. The poem tells you what shape it wants to be, and, and there it is. It's, it's as though the poems are giving bodily expression to the questions that you're running over through through the through the poem yes yeah that's 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 a nice way of putting it Neil yeah well we've had a, a lovely discussion here um we can't talk all night and we have to let our audiences go off and have their suppers and such uh so I'd like to thank Greta Jane and Shazia for giving us these wonderful readings tonight from their new books and I'd like to encourage the audience um, to buy them, obviously. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to wind up now. Uh, I also need to thank um, Fergus here for keeping quiet throughout the reading, although he's been here. He actually came into the reading at the moment when uh, a cat was mentioned in one of Greta's poems, and he's been here ever since. So yeah. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. It's been lovely being here. Bye everyone. We can't see you or know who you are, but. <laughs>